We don't have records on that 9/11 was done by Muslims. It is just just a hypothesis. Muslims are being targeted. They call as terrorists. Directly and indirectly, they are the politicians. For the vote bank, for the power, for the money. The thousands of innocent people that have been killed in Afghanistan goes to Iraq. More people are being robbed. More people are being raped. The main purpose is what? Oil. It's an open secret. We have Buddhist terrorists, we have Hindu terrorists, we have Sikh terrorists, we have Jewish terrorists, we have Christian terrorists. Terrorism is not the monopoly of any religion. It is not. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Al Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma abad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل جاء الحق وزاك الباطل إن الباطل كان نزهوكا رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Honorable Justice Husband Suresh My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? First, let us understand what is the meaning of the word terrorism. It is very difficult to define the word terrorism. There are various different definitions. And many of them contradict. The definition is intangible. It keeps on changing depending upon the geographical location and the historical fact. It is very difficult to define terrorism. But according to the Oxford Dictionary, it says that terrorism is a use of violent action to get and fulfill a political aim or to force a government to act. This word terrorism was initially first time coined in 1790s during the French Revolution. And it was in 1790s that the statesman Edwin Burke, who was a British statesman, he used this word to describe the Jacobin ruled French regime. And the years 1793 and 1794, it was called the reign of terror, the years of terror. And Maximilian Robespierre, he was heading this government. And during that time, he has killed thousands of people. He has guillotined thousands of innocent human beings. Historical records tell us that he had arrested more than 500,000 human beings out of which 40,000 he has executed. More than 200,000 were deported and more than 200,000 they were starved and tortured to death in the prisons. So this word terrorism initially was coined to describe the people during the French Revolution. Today we have in the international media there is a very common statement which is repeatedly bombarded especially in the Western media. And that statement is, all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. And this statement was even imported to India, especially after the 11th of July, the serial train bomb blast that took place in Bombay, especially to Bombay. And we find that even in India, especially in Bombay, people kept on repeating the statement that all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. Let us analyze today what do the historical records tell us and what does the data on terrorist attack that is available in world history, what do they tell us? When we look at the records in 19th century, we can hardly find any terrorist attacks have been done by Muslims. Time does not permit me to speak about the details of the attacks taking place in the 19th century. I'll just mention a couple of them. We know that in 1881, Tsar Alexander II of Russia, he was assassinated. 
He was traveling in a bulletproof carriage in St. Petersburg Street. There was a bomb that kills innocent 21 bystanders. He comes out of the bulletproof carriage, another bomb comes, and he's killed. He was not killed by a Muslim. He was killed by Ignis. He was a Pole from Burbusk. He was a non-Muslim. He was an anarchist. We know in 1886, there was a bomb blast that took place in the hay market in Chicago during the labor rally. And 12 innocent people were killed. One amongst them was a policeman by the name of Dijin. Later on, seven policemen were injured and they died in the hospital. The people responsible for this act, they were not Muslims. There were eight anarchists, all of them non-Muslims. When we analyze the record of the terrorist attacks that have taken place in the 20th century, we know from the historical records that on the 6th of September, 1901, the then president of USA, William McKinley, he was assassinated by an anarchist by the name of Leon. He was shot twice by Leon. He was a non-Muslim. On the 1st of October, 1910, there was a bomb blast that took place in the Los Angeles Times newspaper building, in which 21 innocent people were killed. The people responsible for this bomb blast, there were two Christians by the name of James and Joseph. They were union leaders. They were non-Muslims. We know that on the 28th of June, 1914, in Sarvajo, France, the Archduke of Austria, along with his wife, they were assassinated, which precipitated the World War I. The people responsible for this assassination, they were called the young Bosnia. Most of them, they were Serbs. They were not Muslims. From historical record, we come to know that on the 16th of April, 1925, there was a bomb blast that took place in St. Nedelia Church in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, in which more than 150 innocent people were killed and more than 500 injured. It was the biggest terrorist attack that has taken place on the soil of Bulgaria. It was conducted by the Bulgarian Communist Party. They were non-Muslims. We know from historical records that on the 9th of October, 1934, King Alexander I of Yugoslavia, he was assassinated by a gunman by the name of Lada Georgiev. He was a non-Muslim. The first US plane to be hijacked, it was not by a Muslim, it was by a non-Muslim by the name of Otis. He hijacked the US airliner to Cuba, and he later on got their asylum. When we go to the records of terrorist attacks done, we come to know that in the year 1968, the ambassador to Guatemala, he was assassinated by a non-Muslim. In 1969, the ambassador to Japan, he was knifed by a Japanese non-Muslim. The ambassador to Brazil in 1969, he was kidnapped by a non-Muslim. The famous attack, the Oklahoma bombing, which took place on 19th of April, 1995, where there was a truck loaded with a bomb, which rammed into the federal building in Oklahoma, which killed 166 innocent human beings. And hundreds of others were injured. Initially, it came in the press, Middle East conspiracy, for days together. Later on, they came to know it were two right-wing activists, Christians by the name of Timothy and Terry, who were responsible for the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma. But when this news comes, it comes for a couple of days and then it vanishes. But before, for several days, Middle East conspiracy, Middle East conspiracy. After World War II, from 1941 to 1948, in a span of eight years, 259 terrorist attacks were conducted by Jewish terrorists. By many organizations, Ignun, Stern Gang, Haganah, and we know of the famous bombing of King David Hotel, which took place on the 22nd of July, 1946. They were conducted by Ignun under the leadership of Menekin Begin, in which 91 innocent people were killed, out of which 28 were British, 41 were Arabs, 17 Jews, and five others. The Ignun group, they dressed up as Arabs to show as though Muslims did the bombing. 
and the person responsible was Manikin Begin. And it was the biggest terrorist attack against the history of British mandate in which 91 people were killed. And at that time, Manikin Begin, he was called as terrorist number one by the British government. Later on, after a few years, he becomes the Prime Minister of Israel. And later on, after a few years, he gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine, a person who has killed... <laughs> a person who has killed hundreds and thousands of innocent human beings becomes the Prime Minister of Israel and later on gets the Nobel Prize for Peace. And most of the groups that were fighting, like Stern Gang, Ignun, Haganah, all of these Jewish groups and the leaders, like Yatisak Suribin, Menachem Begin, Ariel Sharon, later on became prime ministers and high holding ranks in the state of Israel. And all of them, they were fighting for a Jewish state. If you see the world map, before 1945, Israel did not exist. Israel didn't exist. These Jewish groups, they were called as terrorists by the Britishers. They fought for a Jewish state. Later on, with power, they grabbed the land and they kicked the Palestinians out. And now these same people are calling the same Palestinians who are fighting for a more just cause, for getting the land back. And they are labeled today as terrorists by the Israelis. <laughs> Imagine Hitler insulated six million Jews. He kicks the Jewish community out. Why should they come to Palestine? The Palestinians, they welcome the cousins with open hands. If they should take a land, they should go back to Germany. They should go back to Europe. Imagine the Palestinian, they welcome the cousins. Imagine, suppose a visitor comes to your house. Being a stranger, you welcome him in your house. After a few days, he kicks you out of the house. And when you cry at the doorstep, I want my house back, people call you a terrorist. <laughs> this is exactly what has happened today. The Palestinians, they are called as terrorists. For what? They only want the land back. And so-called people, most of these powerful first world countries, they are agreeing with this unjust cause. We know that in Germany, from historical records, from 1968 to 1992, the Badr-Benhoff gang, they killed several innocent human beings. In Italy, we come to know from records about the Red Brigades, which has killed several innocent human beings. They were also responsible for kidnapping the Prime Minister of Italy, Aldo Moro. And after 55 days, they killed him. Further, when we come, a similar gang, a similar terrorist outfit, we know, was also in Japan. The Japanese Red Army. They were Buddhist cult. Om Shirito, they were Buddhist cult. And they tried to kill thousands of people in the Tokyo subway by the nerve gas. But unfortunately, they weren't very successful. They were only able to kill 12 people, but more than 5,700 innocent human beings, they were injured and wounded because of this nerve gas. They were put this. In UK, for about 100 years, the IRA, Irish Republican Army, they are conducting attacks against UK. They are Catholics, but they are never called as Catholic terrorists. They are called as IRA. And we know they have conducted several terrorist attacks. Only 1972, three bomb blasts were done. In the first one, seven people were killed. In the second one, 11 were killed. And third one, nine were killed. In 1974, they did two bomb blasts. In the Guildford pub, they killed five innocent people and injured 44 people. In the Birmingham pub, 21 innocent people were killed by the bomb blast and 182 were injured. Time doesn't permit me to speak about all the activity they did. I'm just mentioning a few, just at random. In 1996, they did a bomb blast in London where two people were killed and more than 100 were injured. Further, in 1996, a bomb blast was done in the shopping area of Manchester where 206 people were injured. In 1998, Bambridge bomb blast, where 500 pounds of bomb was loaded in a car in which 35 innocent people were injured. In the same year, we know from records about the OMAC bomb blast, where a 500 pound of bomb was put in a car and 29 innocent people were killed and 330 were injured. All these records are from non-Muslim sources. They have not been written by Muslims. 
all from non-Muslim sources, from Amnesty report, from BBC. If you go on the internet, you can cross-check. But many a time when the number is big, there may be a difference. Like today we know how many people killed, 296, one report says 294, one says 293, so I played safe and say more than 290. The report, if it's a large number, may differ by a few here and there. If it's a small number, it's precise. All these by non-Muslim sources. In 2001, the BBC was born by IRA. But these people, they are not called as Catholic terrorists. Today, the UK government is more afraid of Muslim terrorists. I don't know from the records of the UK government how many confirmed Muslim terrorists have done bomb blast in UK. Even the London bombing of 7th July, there's no confirmed report. They are suspected to be Muslims. It's not confirmed. In which more than 50 people were killed. One report says 52, one report says 56. Therefore, I said more than 50 people were killed. Even if you agree for sake of argument that they were Muslims who did the 7th July bomb blast in the year 2005, yet they come nowhere close to IRA. IRA puts these bomb blasts to shame. They have killed hundreds and thousands of people. Yet today, the UK government is more afraid. IRA is doing since more than 100 years. But because of the advice of George Bush, Tony Blair is more afraid of the Muslim terrorists rather than the problem which is there for more than 100 years. We know from historical records that in Spain and France, the terrorist organization is ETA. They have conducted 36 attacks. And in Africa, there are so many organizations, the list is exhaustive. But the one which is worth noting, and one of the most notorious, is called as the Lord's Salvation Army. It's a Christian terrorist organization. They train young children to commit terrorist attacks. When we come to Sri Lanka, we know of the LTTE, Tamil Tigers. They are supposed to be one of the most notorious, most violent of all the terrorist organizations in the world. They are the people who are experts in suicide bombing. And they even take help of children. They train them and they let them take part in suicide bombing. Normally people are known that the Palestinian is suicide bombing, Iraq is suicide bombing. If you historical record, the people who have popularized suicide bombing are the LTTE, Tamil Tigers. Who are they? They are Hindus. But the Indian report doesn't say Hindu terrorists, they say LTTE. When we come to India, many a times, most of the terrorist attacks that we hear of, majority of them, they talk about Kashmiri militants. Whether the attacks are right or wrong, we can discuss some other time. But how many times do we hear? And what Justice Hospital Sarai said, he named many of the terrorist attacks taking place in India. I wonder how many of the people in the audience have heard of them in the newspapers? How many? Those people who are involved, like honorable people like Justice Hasbir Suresh, and those in the field, they are aware of it. But the general masses, we aren't aware of it. Whenever terrorist attacks are talked about, most often they are talked about Muslim terrorists. Why? In India, there are terrorist organizations belonging to almost all different religions. Almost all. We know of the Sikh terrorist organization, Brindanwala Group, in Punjab. We know that the Indian government, on the 5th of June, 1984, they took over the Golden Temple, in which 100 human beings were killed. In retaliation, a few months later, on 31st of October, 1984, the then Prime Minister, Srimad Indira Gandhi, she was assassinated by one of her security guards who was the Sikh. If you go to the South Asian terrorism hotel site, not run by Muslims, run by non-Muslims, and you see the list of terrorist attacks done by all the people, the Muslims are in a minority. But that's never highlighted in the media. If you go to northeast of India, if you go to Tripura, the Christian terrorist organization exists, like ATTF, All Tripura, Tiger Force, NLFT, National Liberation Front of Tripura. They're Christians. They have killed several Hindus. Reports, if you go on the site, four Hindus killed, eight Hindus killed. On 2nd October 2004, 44 Hindus were killed and several were injured by this group. They were Christians. In Assam, Ulfa. Ulfa alone, in a span of the past 16 years, from 1990 to 2006, they have conducted successfully 749 terrorist attacks. 
they will put the Kashmiri militants to shame. 749 confirmed terrorist attacks. But when we read in the newspaper, we only know about the Kashmiri attacks. And I remember a couple of years back, I am called, alhamdulillah, by God's grace, by several parts of India, from several parts of the world. I had many invitations from Kashmir, but is it the right time to go, yes or no? Finally, in September 2003, I decided to go to Kashmir. And there I gave a talk in Srinagar, and they told me, the organizers, that in the past 14 years, first time the government gave permission for a public talk. And they organized my talk in polo grounds in Kashmir, in which 100,000 people attended. In all this turmoil, and the government gave me security. I was wondering, why are these people with machine guns with me? I went off to the various sites, Gulmarg, Pahalgam, gave talks, etc. Fine, I didn't think it was required. Later on, I happened to go to Assam to give talks. And the moment I land on the airport, I find security guards around me. I said, why? And there, I thanked God, Alhamdulillah. If they would not have been there, I wouldn't have come back here. <laughs> I did not know. I did not know that so many terrorists are there in Assam. The Ulfa are trained only to target the Muslims. They are Hindus. How many times does the press, the media report about them? Because it's not tantalizing. These reports may come in the news brief, it does appear. News briefs, how many people note it? Never in the headlines. In news briefs, amongst the organizations, terrorist organizations, the Naxalites. We know of the Maoists. The Maoists are communist. Number one terrorist attacks that have been done in India, maximum are by the Maoists. Only in Nepal, in the past seven years, they have conducted 99 terrorist attacks. And out of the 600 districts in India, according to the Indian government, according to the site on terrorism, they say that they are present in 150 districts of India. They have done terrorist attacks in one-third parts of India. Number one, if you compare the people they have killed, the attacks they have done, compared to the Kashmir militants, it's no way comparable. The Maoists are a bigger danger for India, but yet we find that the government is more afraid of the Muslim terrorists. Why? The reason is George Bush. Just a couple of days back, on the 9th of September, an article came in Times of India, not on the front page, inside, but quite a big article, that 875 rockets, a haul of ammunition, 875 rockets, which were supposed to be supplied to the Maoists, they were intercepted and they were confiscated, and 30 rocket launchers. Imagine it is the biggest haul in the history of India that any terrorist organization that the government has caught. 875 rockets, they can wage a war against the Indian Army. And the DGP of Andhra Pradesh in Hyderabad, he was shocked. He said that with these rocket launchers, they can attack any police station, any tanks of the Indian government from a distance of 600 meters, from more than half a kilometer away, they can attack the Indian tanks, the Indian police station, and you can't do anything. Rocket launchers. Yet we see people are more afraid of people who have a beard, people are wearing a cap, people have trousers above the ankle. Are they more dangerous than the rocket launchers? Why? Why are they targeting the Muslims particularly? It's a question. It is a ploy of the Western media, the media controlled by the politicians, and when we analyze, we can surely say, without any doubt, that terrorism is not a Muslim monopoly. Not only is it not a Muslim monopoly, it is not even a speciality of the Muslims. It is not even encouraged by Islam. It is prohibited in Islam. I, being a student of comparative religion, I cannot say that all the religions say that you should not kill innocent human beings. But I can surely say that most of the religions, the majority of the religions, if you read the scriptures, they say that you should not kill innocent human beings. And the leader of all these religions is Islam. Islam says, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, the ayat, the verse which was recited by the Qari, it says that if anyone, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. 
I know of many religious scriptures which say that you should not kill innocent human beings. But Quran does not only say that, it says that if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for creating corruption or for spreading mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Quran goes a step further and says that if you kill any innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. I don't know of any religious scripture which says that if you kill any innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And further Quran goes on to say that if you save any single life, any single human being, it is as though you have saved the whole of humankind. Islam is derived from the Arabic word salam or salam, which means peace. It comes from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam in short means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. Islam condemns all forms of terrorism, all forms of acts which kill innocent human beings. Irrespective whether it's 9-11, whether Twin Tower of Attack, or the 7th of July, where more than 50 innocent people were killed in London bomb blast. The New York Towers, more than 3,000 people were killed in the London bomb blast, more than 50 were killed. Or whether it be the serial bomb blast in 93 of Bombay, where more than 250 people were killed. Or the bomb blast that took place recently, on the 11th of July 2006, where more than 200 people were killed, are to be condemned. It is prohibited. You cannot justify killing of any innocent human being. Many Muslims, many a times, to appease the government, they put a full stop there. I never put a full stop here. I continue and say, we also have to condemn the thousands of Afghanis that have been killed in Afghanistan, the thousands of innocent people that have been killed in Iraq, the thousands of people that are killed in Gujarat, the thousands of people killed in Palestine, thousands of people killed in Lebanon. We can't put a full stop. Who are you afraid of? All sorts of terrorism in which innocent human beings are killed have to be condemned, whether done by Muslims or non-Muslims. We don't have records that 9-11 or 7 July or the recent serial bomb blast in the train confirmed records done by Muslims. It is just a hypothesis. But irrespective, after we come to know the truth, whether it's done by Muslim or non-Muslim, it is to be condemned. It is prohibited. We know that most of the religions, they don't preach that you should kill innocent human beings. Terrorism is not the monopoly of any religion. It is not. But when we analyze, we have terrorists that claim to profess certain religions. And when we analyze, they are from all types of religions. We have Christian terrorists, we have Catholic terrorists, we have Jewish terrorists, we have Hindu terrorists, we have Muslim terrorists, we have Buddhist terrorists, we have Sikh terrorists. Terrorists professing very different faiths. But most of the religions, they condemn the killing of innocent human beings. And when we do a survey, that though we know that religions don't encourage killing innocent human beings, when we do a survey and try and find out that the people that have killed the maximum innocent human beings, which religion do you profess? Number one, the human being that has killed the maximum innocent human beings. Who is he? Who is he? Hitler. He has insinuated six million Jews. And indirectly, if you count all the people killed in the World War II, 60 million people. Number one, was he a Muslim? He was a Christian. Joseph Stalin, called as Uncle Joe, he has estimated to have killed 20 million human beings. He has starved 14.5 million human beings to death. When we go to China, Mao Zedong, he has killed 14 to 20 million human beings. He was a non-Muslim. He was not a Muslim. We know from record that Mussolini in Italy alone has killed 400,000 human beings, innocent human beings. The person after whom the French Revolution is named, Maximilien Robespierre, he has starved and tortured to death more than 200,000 people and executed more than 40,000 people. Ashoka, we know, in one battle alone, in Kalinga battle, he has killed 100,000 people. More than 100,000 people. Was he a Muslim? He was a Hindu. We have a own black sheep also. Rakosh tell that Saddam Hussein is responsible for the death of a few hundred thousand people. But the embargo put by George Bush 
on Iraq alone has killed half a million children in Iraq alone. Half a million. In one shot, only on the embargo put by USA, UN, on Iraq, half a million children have died. In Indonesia, Momma Sato, even he has claimed to have killed 500,000 people, but if nothing compared to Hitler, nothing compared to Uncle Joe, Joseph Stalin, nothing compared to Mao Sosing of China. Each individual will put all the Muslims together to shame. I'm not trying to say that the followers of this religion, they were practicing the religion, they were not religious. Otherwise, they wouldn't have ever killed innocent human beings. But yet we find in the international media, we find that Muslims are being targeted. Muslims are called as fundamentalists, as extremists. They're called as terrorists. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist, by definition, means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if a person wants to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of science, he can't be a good scientist. For a person to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he can't be a good mathematician. You can't paint all fundamentals with the same brush that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. If you have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, he's bad for the society. On the other hand, if you have a fundamentalist doctor who saves thousands of human beings, he's good for the society. So depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I'm concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim, and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Because I know, I follow, and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be, there may be a few fundamentals of Islam, which the non-Muslim may feel is against humanity. But the moment you give the logical reason, the background for these fundamentals, there is not a single unbiased human being who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. <laughs> this word fundamentalism, we come to know from Webster Dictionary, that it was first coined to describe a group of Christians in the early part of the 20th century in America who protested against the church. They were called as Protestant Christians. Initially, the church, they believed that the message of the Bible is from God. These Protestant Christians, they protested and said, not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every word, every letter of the Bible is from God, this movement is a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that every word of the Bible is not from Almighty God, then this movement is not a good movement. When we refer to the Oxford Dictionary for the definition of the word fundamentalist, it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient teachings and doctrines of any religion. But when we refer to the revised new edition, there's a slight change. The new edition says, that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient teachings and doctrines of any religion, especially Islam. <laughs> so the word especially Islam has been added to the revised definition. The moment you hear the word Muslim, you start thinking he's a fundamentalist, he's extremist, he's a terrorist. And many of us Muslims, we go on the defense, I'm not a fundamentalist, I'm not an extremist. I say I'm an extremist. I'm extremely honest, I'm extremely just, I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely peaceful, I'm extremely merciful. <laughs> I want to know what is wrong in being extremely just, extremely honest, extremely kind, extremely merciful. You can't be partly just when it benefits you and if you're just. When it doesn't benefit you not, you have to be extremely just. That's what the Quran says. Our religious scripture, the word of our mighty God, says you have to be fully just. We can't expect a judge to be partly just when he wants he does justice, otherwise no. So what's wrong? And I want to ask any human being, can he tell me that being extremely honest is wrong, extremely just is wrong, extremely peaceful is wrong? We have to be an extremist, but in the right direction. So when someone says I'm extremist, I have to be an extremist Muslim. Only if I'm an extremist Muslim can I be a good Muslim. 
Otherwise, I can't. I know these terminologies have been manipulated. The definitions keep on changing. But we have to turn the tables over. We can't partly follow the Quran. We have to extremely and completely follow the Quran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 208, Allah says, Utkhlafisil mikaffa, enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Today, Muslims, they label that terrorist. The basic and simple definition of terrorist is a person who causes terror. For example, if a criminal sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the criminal, the policeman is a terrorist. In this context, I say that every Muslim should be a terrorist. Whenever any criminal sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any rapist sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any robber sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any anti-social element sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. That's what the Quran says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 60, that cause terror in the hearts of the anti-social elements. Those people who are killing wrong people, who are against humanity, Quran says, cause terror in their hearts. I know that commonly the word terrorist means terrorizing innocent human beings. In this context, no Muslim should ever terrorize any innocent human being. It is private in Islam. <laughs> we know that many a times two different labels are given for the same person, for the same individual, for the same activity. For the 60 years back, when India was being ruled by the British government, there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. These Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But we common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, then you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you have to call them as patriots, as freedom fighters. These same very Britishers, they call Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad, Subhash Chandra Bose as terrorists. Do we agree? Not at all. Just because the Britishers say, just because the Americans say, we don't have to believe, we have to fight for justice. They were patriots, they were freedom fighters. Therefore, before you give a label to any individual, you have to try and find out for what reason is he striving. We have several such examples in world history. Time does not permit us to give all the details. I'll just give one more example of the American Revolution, which took place in the 19th century. And we know in 1875, during the American Revolution, there were many Americans who were fighting for the freedom. The British were ruling America. And these people who fought for the freedom by the British government, they were called as terrorists. And number one in the forefront was Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. We know that these people by the British government, they were called as terrorists, number one. George Washington was called terrorist number one. Later on, he becomes the president of USA. And he happens to be the same terrorist number one. He becomes the president of USA and happens to be the godfather of all the presidents to come, including George Bush. <laughs> Imagine the same people who the British has called as terrorists. Now read your Bible. If you read the Bible, the Bible speaks about fighting. If you read the book of Numbers, chapter number 31, verse number 1 to 19. The book of Exodus, chapter number 22, verse number 18 to 20. The book of Exodus, chapter number 32, verse number 27 to 28. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, said, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 22, verse number 36, that take you the sword and go and fight. So immediately, most of the custom officers, eight or ten, gathered together and they started asking, Sir, can we ask you one more question? <laughs> so I just told my host on the mobile that please don't worry, I'm stuck up here, I'm just doing dawa. <laughs> I keep on traveling, mashallah. I've been to Australia, to UK several times. By God's grace, time I did spend not more than a couple of hours. I know many of my colleagues were detained. Many of my colleagues means my speakers. I'm not talking about my Bombay speakers. I'm talking about the international speakers who keep on traveling. They have been detained, they have been deported. Allah's grace that so far I have not been detained. I haven't been deported. Maximum half an hour are dawa. And I see to it that whenever I get opportunity, I grab it. But I see to it that I quote the scriptures. I follow the guidance of the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. So when we come to common terms, most of the problems are solved. This talk 
what we're having today, was supposed to be held more than a month back. I was supposed to be in London. That's why the stock is delayed. And when I landed on the 10th of August on Heathrow Airport, and I received a call from my wife. Thakir, where are you? I said, why? No, are you in the airport outside? What happened? He said, no, we just received information that there are some 21 Muslims arrested who are supposed to bomb blast, etc., etc. But alhamdulillah, I had my own camera crew with me. We were 12 of us. All of them, cap, beard, God's grace, we passed through very well. I had my talk in Birmingham. It was successful. Next day, sometimes we go and do shooting. So next day, we went to one of the Jewish graveyards and we were shooting. Shooting, not shooting, we were recording. <laughs> you know, we in our lingo, we say shooting means recording on the video camera. Just to get stock shot of the city. And we spent a couple of hours in the Jewish graveyard. Later on, we went to one of the churches, did the recording shooting. Then we went for breakfast and we came back to the hotel in the afternoon. Then we get information. The police of Birmingham, they're trying to track us down. Maybe some passerby went and complained. They were looking for seven or eight terrorists with cap and beard. Who are these people? They had the number, plate, and they knew it was a green car. So what they did, they phoned the insurance company and they tried to find out where we were. And finally, they located us in the hotel. But luckily, while doing inquiry, they even happened to speak with the person who I had breakfast with. And he happened to be a very famous politician, Muslim politician. So when the chief of that area, of the police station, spoke to him, that you know, we're looking for these terrorists. He said, what nonsense they're talking? Do you know, two months back, I had given you a DVD of a person by the name of Dr. Zakir Naik. He said, yes, he's the same person. Oh, same person. Problem solved. The passerbys who had reported, you know, beard is dangerous. Beard, cap, dangerous. You have to be careful. But again, God's help. Allah's help, and I'm safely back here, otherwise I wouldn't have been here to give the talk. We Muslims should not be afraid, we should speak the truth, but with hikmah. You have to be careful. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, ila wal muazzatil hasna, ahsan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them, and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. When we speak, you have to speak with hikmah. Now we realize, after seeing the scenario, that who has the monopoly on terrorism? And according to me, terrorism is a monopoly of the politicians. <laughs> according to my understanding and survey, terrorism is a monopoly of the politicians. Irrespective, they may be politicians of USA, of UK or India, it is the monopoly of the politicians. We have to realize what is the cause of terrorism. If we want to abolish terrorism, first we have to understand the root cause. I, being a doctor, we don't believe in symptomatic treatment. We believe in trying and finding out what is the cause and killing the germ. That's a better treatment. What is the cause of terrorism? The experts say that the cause of terrorism is injustice. When injustice is done on a particular group of people, when wrong is done on a particular group of people, they tend to retaliate. And that is the only cause of terrorism. And when we realize that whether it be the 9-11, the destruction of the Twin Towers in New York, whether it be the 7th July, the bombing in London, or the serial bomb blast, 93 in Bombay, or the recent bomb blast on 11th of July, whether it be the thousands of people killed in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Gujarat, in Bosnia, whether it be in Palestine, in Lebanon, we find that behind them, the main cause are the politicians. I was wondering that when I landed in UK, that why were 21 young Muslims arrested? The government said we were keeping track on them for several months. Many people I met who knew these people were arrested personally. They said impossible. They can't be involved. What we realize that the people wait. When should this news come out? At that time, Israel was attacking Lebanon. Thousands of people were killed. The Britishers were objecting. So then you have a diversion. 21 Muslims supposed to bomb the airline are arrested. It's a bigger news, so people forget about thousands of innocent people being killed in Lebanon. <laughs> Same thing in India, Kargil. Any problem politicians, talk about Kargil. Talk about the enemy, Pakistan. Diversion, politics. 
whether it be in USA, whether it be in UK, whether it be in India. The major cause are the politicians. We know that our country, more than 60 years back, they were ruled by the Britishers, and they had a policy of divide and rule. More than 50 years back, we got freedom from the Britishers, but unfortunately, they have left, but they have left the policy behind. And our Indian politicians, they have adopted this policy of divide and rule. They adopt this policy of divide and rule for the vote bank. <laughs> From records, you come to know that the country which has the maximum rights anywhere in the world, it is India. If not daily, at least once a week, we have communal rights. This great country of us, so many great religions are there. Maximum rights, communal rights. And the major cause, almost all, directly and indirectly, they are the politicians. For the vote bank, for the power, for the money. They engineer these things. Otherwise, normally, I have met non-Muslims. It's my job, it's my profession. I am a student of comparative religion. I keep on meeting different sorts of people. Generally, the common Indian, irrespective of whether he's Hindu or a Muslim, they would love to live with each other harmoniously. They would love to live peacefully. We may have our differences. We don't want to fight. But it is these politicians. It is these politicians who engineer hatred amongst different religions so that they could fill the vote bank. And you see almost all the rights that have taken place, indirectly or directly, they are the cause. We know that a few years back, there was a political gimmick. The Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi issue. You know Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi issue in Ayodhya? I would like to know how many of us Muslims and Hindus knew about Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi before the politicians made it a gimmick. How many of us knew? I had never heard of this Babri Masjid. And when I asked the common Hindu, he had never heard of this. Only after the politicians made it a political gimmick, people knew about it. And we know on the 6th of December, 1992, they wanted to have a big procession, a gathering at this site. The Supreme Court had explicitly said that no gathering anywhere close to the disputed site. A group of politicians, they make it a political gimmick of Ram Jan Bhumi issue and the Babri Masjid issue. They want to gather on 6th of December. The ruling politicians know very well that they have the Supreme Court backing they could have easily stopped the gathering, easily. But then they think, if I stop, I may lose vote. So they let the gathering take place. <laughs> the gathering takes place, and then they say, spontaneously, the thousands of cars were gathered there. Spontaneously, the Babri Masjid was destroyed, spontaneously. You know, there was live recording on the various satellite channels. We know that with trishus and lathis, how can you get down a structure? Is it possible? No. They had planted explosives with this pre-planned act that planted explosives. Anyone can see. You don't have to be a specialist of military. You can see it with your eyes. That explosives were planted, and that's how the structure came down. Can the structure come down with lathis and trishus? Maybe George Bush saw this. 6 December 1992, that's how he had conducted the inside job of 11 September. <laughs> Time does not permit me to speak about the inside job. That requires a lecture by itself. Inside job of 11 September. Many Americans have spoken about that. Maybe he saw it and he got the idea that let's conduct in New York also. Later on, what happens? This emerges into rights. Throughout the country, there were rights. It is the largest right after partition in the whole country, where tens of thousands of innocent human beings were killed, mainly Muslims. Who's to blame? The innocent Indians. They are instigated by the politicians. Fight. Kill the opposite religion people. Instigated. Innocent people, they get instigated, and they do the act. We know that even in Bombay, one of the cities that was maximum affected was Bombay. Even during partition, the riots that took place in Bombay was the worst in the history of Bombay. Even during partition, so many people were not killed as during the December 92 and January 93 riots. The police, if they wanted, they could have easily prevented the riot, very easy. With the backing of the reserve police, with the backing of the military, easily they could have done it. 
but they did not do it. Most of them were silent spectators. Some were good, they tried, but they were in a minority. Majority were silent spectators, some were party to it. I am aware that even the police is controlled by the politicians. So the police wants to do something, the politicians come in between, so the blame goes back to the politicians. Later on, the government appoints a single judge commission to appease the minority. And they appointed Justice Sri Krishna. It was famously called as the Sri Krishna Commission. And we know that Justice Sri Krishna, he was and is a devout and a practicing Hindu. But at the same time, he's an upright and honest judge, just like how we have Justice Suresh here. An honest and an upright judge. The verdict he gave, it did not go down the throat of the government. It takes a few years. And he had analyzed the full cases of the riot. He spoke with the politicians, with the police. Individually, he visited 26 police stations, analyzed the records, spoke with the police officer, junior and senior, spoke with the victims, spoke with the media. And after a great deal of research, he presented, we have this damning verdict of Sri Krishna Commission. He even gave suggestions how can we prevent these rights? But, you know, it takes time. By the time this happened, the government says bygones are bygones. Because they know if they implement the report, they are afraid that they will lose the vote bank. At that time, to appease the minority, they appointed the commission. How many commissions? I don't know. How many, I don't know how many commissions have been implemented. I think Justice Suresh can tell. How many commissions that they appoint have really been implemented in India? How many? So here we know it is a delaying tactics. The innocent Indians, especially the Muslim victims, we have faith in the judiciary system of India. If the politicians betray us, if our other citizen fellow members betray us, if the police betrays us, in this country, we have yet faith in the judiciary system. And we know that finally, most of the innocent people, whether they are arrested, etc. They are finally released. But the damage done to them, it cannot be undone. Later on, we come to know, after a couple of months, on 12th of March, 1993, there was a series of 13 bomb blasts in Bombay, in which more than 250 innocent citizens of Bombay were killed. More than 250 innocent human beings were killed. And more than 700 human beings were injured. The opposition said, oh, planned everything. Just as Shri Krishna said, it was not meticulously planned, it was a retaliation. More than one and a half thousand innocent Muslims killed in riots in Bombay. More than one and a half thousand innocent Muslims during the Bombay riots of December 92 and January 93 were killed. It was a retaliation. And the authorities and the police said, it was done by Muslim underworld with the help of some others. That's how the bomb blast took place. And they say, all of them agreed, even the police commissioner, they agreed that it was a retaliation to what had happened in Bombay. We know that immediately after the riots of December 92 and January 93, it was difficult for the Muslims to walk on the streets. It was difficult for him to travel in the train, travel in the bus, to work in a non-Muslim area. They were looked down upon, they were ridiculed. Immediately, after 12th March, 93 bomb blast, the whole scenario changes. Most of the Muslims, they know that killing innocent people is prohibited. Yet, they had a soft corner for these people who did the bomb blast. They were happy internally. In Islam, two wrongs don't make a right. Islam condemned this act. <laughs> killing innocent human being is to be condemned you cannot kill innocent human being if somebody else has done injustice to you. You can't kill a third person even if you belong to the same community. Islam prohibits that. Whoever did it, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, whoever killed more than 250 innocent human beings on 12th March 1993, Islam condemns it. Most of the Muslims knew that killing innocent people is haram, it is prohibited, yet they were internally happy. But you cannot use wrong means to reach a right goal. You cannot. 
Islam does not permit that you use the wrong method to reach a right goal. There cannot be any justification. We realize that Muslims are harassed, they were tortured, they were killed, but you can't justify the killing of innocent human beings. Imagine the family of those more than 250 innocent human beings. When they come to know that the Muslims have killed us, they will think, what kind of religion is this? What wrong did they do? Did they harass you? The person who has harassed you, if you catch him and put him to trial and he is a culprit and you punish him, no problem. All religions give you permission. The innocent people killed on the street, what wrong did they do to you? Imagine he will become a permanent enemy of Islam. Islam does not justify the killing of any innocent human being. It is to be condemned. When we realize the chain of sequence of events, who is to be blamed? We come to know that prevention is better than cure. Who is to be blamed? When we see the sequence of events, we come to know that if the opposition politicians, the politician from the opposition party, if they would not have used Babri Masjid and Ram Janbhumi issue as a political plank, the Bombay bomb blast in 93 wouldn't have taken place. Later on, the politicians in power, they could have easily prevented the gathering. They could have easily prevented the destruction of the Babri Masjid. Easily. They had the Supreme Court verdict. They had the military, they had the police, but they were afraid that if we do it, we we'll lose vote bank, so they let the destruction take place. Second people responsible are the politicians in power. Third people, the innocent Indians, they are instigated against the minority. And they involve in killing of thousands of innocent Muslims. They are too responsible. But they are innocent people. Fourth people responsible is the police. The police could have easily prevented the riots in Bombay. Or anywhere in India, easily. The normal civilians, we are military trained. We cannot fight with the police. It's easy. It's very easy for the police of any city, especially Bombay, to prevent the rats. Very easy. Preventing terrorist attacks is difficult. I'll come to it later on. But rats is very easy. Easy. But they didn't do it. Some were afraid. There were a few who went out of the way and helped the innocent victims. But the majority were silent spectators. Some even were party to it. Some who were silent spectators, they were afraid that if we went again, the politician would have been transferred. They too are to be blamed. Fourth people to be blamed are the police. Fifth, last, but not the least, the people who committed this bomb blast. Islam does not give permission to use wrong means to reach the right goal. All five categories are to be equally blamed. If you want to stop terrorist attacks, go to the root cause. Stop the injustice. Stop the wrong done to a particular group of people and terrorism will stop. It is difficult for the police to stop the bomb blast. We know, we understand. It's not easy, it's difficult. But to stop the riots, very easy. Same case, you see most of the riots that took place in India, they have the same sequence, same people are involved, the details may differ. Same group of people involved. We have the other example of the Gujarat massacre that started on 27th of February 2002 and went on till March 2002. It was followed after the burning of a single coach of the Sabravati Express at Godhra on the 26th of February 2002. We know very well it is nothing hidden. It's an open secret that this train, the bogey that was burned, According to forensic reports, according to circumstantial evidence, it says that the coach was burnt from inside. There are several evidences. But everything was planned. It was pre-planned. Muslims were instigated. There was a gathering. But they didn't kill. They didn't kill the innocent people. They say that 59 car sevaks were killed, yet it is to be doubted. Yes, there may be a few people that have been killed. Many people who were thought to be killed later on were found alive. So then they kept on changing the statement. So it was an inside job. Babri Masjid, inside job. 9-11, inside job. Godra, inside job. Main people to blame, they are the politicians. Then immediately, next day, from 27th of February 2002, no retaliation, pre-planned. It was a state-supervised massacre of the innocent Muslims in Gujarat. 
nothing spontaneous all pre planned and innocent citizens of gujarat they were instigated they were given money you can see evidence to kill thousands of innocent muslims according to the state of gujarat 793 muslims were killed and 253 hindus were killed but according to several human rights organizations they said approximately 2 to 2 to 1/2000 innocent human beings were killed almost all of them they were muslims other report says that more than 5000 innocent muslims were killed there were thousands of muslim women who were raped there were tens of thousands of muslims who were asked to leave the house the houses were looted they were burnt there were tens and thousands of muslims whose places of business they were burnt they were completely destroyed the people killed in gujarat massacre is far more the number than the 911 the loss of the people of gujarat if you add it it is much more than the loss that took place on 911 yet according to george bush the people who did gujarat massacre they aren't terrorists only if you harm the americans then there's a problem <laughs> we know that there are tons of evidence tons of evidence in form of literature newspaper booklets you have the communism combat you have video tapes vcds dvds actual recordings of the culprits the people responsible yet no action taken even the judiciary system i am sorry to say in gujarat failed i think they were pressurized by the politicians so much so that the supreme court of india had to pass a remark against the high court of gujarat that they were biased and the trials were correct <laughs> i feel it was mainly the politicians the supreme court of india they passed a judgment against the high court of gujarat that what verdict they gave was wrong and i feel maybe it was the politicians who have used the power and imagine what we find after a couple of months we have the akshardham temple massacre two people were caught they were killed they said to be muslims and the authority said that these people killed so many people in the temple in revenge in retaliation and they said that all this was nothing but talish islam does not justify that they may have a logic these people who did the attack or the people who retaliated in other ways they have a logic they say that thousands of our family members were killed in front of eyes our mothers our sisters have been raped in front of us we have been looted we know the person responsible is our neighbor the person down the street we meet him regularly but when we see him it reminds us of the torture when they go to the law the law does not support so they take the law in the hand i am not justifying this act islam doesn't permit you they take the law in the hand and they kill other innocent human beings islam does not justify that they have a justification they say our mothers have been raped we know the culprit they in front of us no one is taking action so they take the law in the hand if you really find the culprit and book him and if he's caught if you can do that and punish him islam justifies you can't kill any other innocent human being islam does not justify that you cannot use a wrong mean to come at the right goal however much you may have sympathy for them but the point to be noted islamically it is wrong it's not justified killing innocent human being imagine the hundreds of innocent human beings killed by these people retaliation they in turn become enemies of islam what wrong have they done it is the same thing the holy people kill innocent muslims no you kill innocent hindus it's not justified in islam if you can catch the culprit book him punish him fine but not any innocent human being later on on the 11th of july we have in this year 2006 we have a series of bomb blasts in the train seven bomb blast in the span of 11 minutes in which more than 200 innocent human beings were killed more than 800 were injured the police and authorities they say this too was in retaliation to the thousands of muslims killed in gujarat the authorities say 
It is the hand of the L.E.T. Lashkar Toiba. If you look at the sequence of events, could this have been prevented easily? Who's responsible? Number one, those politicians who had planned the burning of the coach in the Sabarwani Express at Gudra. They are responsible. Number two, the people at the center, at the center government. They could have stopped it, but they belong to the same party. They didn't know anything. Number three, the innocent citizens of Gujarat. They were instigated against the Muslims. And they fell in the trap. They too are responsible. Number four, the police of Gujarat could have easily prevented. They didn't do it. They are responsible. And we know from records that most of the places, it was done under the supervision of the police. If you see the commission report. They too are responsible. Number five, the judiciary system of Gujarat. They didn't take action. Number six, the people who retaliated in the wrong way. The people who did the bomb blast. Islam does not justify that. They too are equally responsible. All six categories of people are responsible. But if we can prevent the first category, the first few categories, surely you will not have these terrorist attacks. <laughs> and we know that in the past one month, thousands of Muslims have been harassed, mainly by the police. The police says it is mainly the Muslims who have done it. It is the hand of the L.E.T. Lashkri Taiba. I say, if you can really identify them, catch the people who are involved, we have no objection. But you can't harass thousands of innocent Muslims. Hundreds of them were rounded up. Hundreds of Muslims, they were detained for days and weeks together. As Justice Suraj said, that hundreds of them, they had been rounded up. Even their family was not informed. Imagine. And the thousands of innocent family members, they too have been harassed. We know about 22 to 25 so far have been officially arrested. All of them, 100%, none of them, not a single arrested case is directly linked with the 10 bomb blast of Bombay. All of them indirectly related to some other event. If you really catch the culprit, if you have proof, you have no objection. But at random picking up the Muslims, what signals are you sending? We know that about more than 300 innocent people were rounded up in Malwani. More than 300. For what? For interrogation. Any logical person will tell you that for interrogation, minimum, you at least require three or four policemen. If you want to do a proper interrogation, one policeman to threaten, one to have a soft approach, one to note down, maybe one to observe. At least three, if not four, minimum three for a proper interrogation. It takes minimum one or two hours. People, experts say four or five hours. I say minimum at least one or two hours. How many interrogation can you do? What is the manpower of the Malmani police station? What is the manpower? How many can they do in a day? 10, 20, 30, 40? How many? How many? What is the manpower? What is the force? Maximum 100 if you let it go. They round up more than 300 people, keep them waiting for the full day, then they take the telephone number and address and leave them. What signals are you sending? It is my request that the police should take the Muslims in confidence. Recently, after the bomb blast, there was a program organized by the non-Muslims. How we have Muslims have here on terrorism. Similar, there was a program organized by the non-Muslims on a similar topic. Topic was different, but the issue was the same by the non-Muslims. And the organizers had invited two ex senior police officials from Bombay, ex. One of them comes and blames the madrasa of Pakistan, the reason for terrorist attacks here. Second one comes and blames the madrasas of India. In the speech you tell them that they should have computers, English, no problem, I'm with you. But to say that the Indian madrasas are directly or indirectly, even remotely, associated with any form of terrorism in India is nothing but a blatant lie. <laughs> Unfortunately for that police officer, there was one of the senior advocates in the audience. After the talk, he went and told him that, can you even give me a single white paper, single proof that any madrasa in India has been proven to be associated with any terrorist act? He said, I don't know. <laughs> Imagine what statement is the senior police officer giving to non-Muslims? What 
message are you sending? The Hindus, in turn, will be against the madrasas. So making such irresponsible statements by senior police officers, say, I'm being careful, I'm not naming, why? Because I'm a responsible citizen. What signals are you sending? I don't know of any madrasa in India. See, they are the center of learning. Fine, we may disagree. We may want English there. We may want modernization. I speak with the people of Madrasa. I may have differences, have more education. Fine, have English, have computers. We agree. But to say that they are involved in terrorist activities, indirectly or directly, even remotely, is nothing but a blatant lie. So what is happening? What message are you giving? We know that hundreds of innocent Muslims are detained. Many were arrested. The police goes and does a search in the house. Then they find some books on jihad. Proof. <laughs> Proof that involved in terrorist attacks. <laughs> the Bombay media reported that these same books are being sold in the bookstores of Muhammad Ali Road for several years. If that was the case, why weren't these bookstores closed down? Same books. Jihad. I would like to tell that do you know the Quran too speaks about jihad. And almost all, every Muslim house has the Quran. Do you mean to say that you're going to arrest all the Muslims of Bombay? What signals are you sending? I, being a student of comparative religion, I would like to say that if you read the Mahabharat, there are more verses of killing in Mahabharat than the Quran. If you have a competition, Mahabharat has more verses of killing people than compared to the Quran. Bhagavad Gita is nothing but a guidance given by Sri Krishna to Arjun. Arjun says, how can I fight against my own cousins? If you read Bhagavad Gita chapter number 1 verse number 43, 44, 45, 46, he puts his arms on the battlefield and says, I would prefer dying unarmed rather than fight my cousins. Immediately. Bhagavad Gita chapter number 2 verse number 2. Sri Krishna, he says, Arjun, how could you be an impotent? And he continues, time doesn't permit me, you can see my videotape. It says that it is the duty of the Kshatriya to fight. When we see in context, I being a student of comparative religion, I agree with all the verses of fighting in Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata because I know the context. It's a fight between justice and injustice. It's a fight between truth and falsehood. And what Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata say, that if you have to fight against falsehood, against injustice, even if it be your cousins, no problem, family members, fight them. We are with it. That is what the Quran says. What my request is, that even the police should know the religious teachings of the different citizens of India. And I always take opportunity, and in the past several years, I have spoken to several non-Muslim police officers, senior police officers in Bombay, in Bangalore, in various cities of India. I was even called a couple of years back to the National Police Academy in Hyderabad, where I addressed more than 100 IPS officers, high-ranking commissioners of police, DIG, IG, DG, the director general of the National Academy was there. And when I spoke, they were shocked. Most of the information I gave, they were shocked. You should know what is the teaching of different religions. Imagine if I pick up these verses of the Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita and quote out of context, surely we can get rights here. We have to understand different religions. And by God's grace, Alhamdulillah, I have spoken to police and military internationally. In UK, in USA, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in UAE. Alhamdulillah. And I love interacting, especially with the non-Muslim police. Giving them the right picture of Islam. Unfortunately, they get the information of Islam from the international media. I'll come to the media in the ending. So what we should say, that we should have understanding. I've been told by several advocates, and as Justice Suresh also said, that hundreds of Muslims were picked up. They were detained. Some of them mentally tortured. Some of them physically tortured. The advocates told me that the clans, as Justice Suresh said, that they were tortured. Some of them were even made to sign on papers they didn't agree, even on blank papers. If you know who the culprits are, select a few, catch them, if proven, if they have done it, they should be punished. We aren't against it. But to catch thousands of innocent Muslims, what signals are you sending? Imagine to catch 10 terrorists, you interrogate and harass 
a thousand innocent Muslims, irrespective whether you catch those 10 terrorists or not, surely you are making 100 new terrorists. Many non-Muslim senior police officers in different parts, in different cities of India, and one particular in Bombay, he told me, Zakir Bhai, Dr. Zakir Naik, I will only be happy if you give talk in Hindi and Urdu. Your talk should be heard by the masses. I didn't speak. Recently, a couple of years back, I started speaking. Many senior non-Muslim police officers in different parts of India, they tell me, they know that by God's grace, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 people come for my talks. And when I went to Kashmir, because I was the official guest, I met the minister, power minister, chief minister, but at that time, the governor of Kashmir, Saxena, he wanted to meet me. My schedule was tight. Non-Muslim, I took out time. He wanted lunch, dinner, no time, I went for breakfast. Saxena, the governor of Kashmir, he happened to be an ex-military man. I forgot his post, some colonel or major or high post he was. And we discussed. He was caring for the people of Kashmir. Later on, he comes to Maharashtra, he comes to Bombay. He wants to meet me. He calls me to the Raj Bhavan, the governor's house. I go and meet there. He tells Dr. Zakir Naik, you know, the impact that you had in Kashmir, the people that follow you, we want you to come again. We want you to come on the television of Kashmir. We want to come on the radio. But what my question is, that do you think my talk will be effective? I know that there is not a single verse in the Quran which justifies the killing of innocent human beings. There is not a single saying, a hadith of the Prophet, that you can kill innocent human beings even if they belong to the same community that does an injustice to you. I know that. I can speak. But imagine if thousands of innocent Muslims are being harassed. The police, they tell us that most probably it's a hand of the L.E.T. Lakshay Toiba. For sake of argument, I agree with it. And the police tells us that the local hand should be involved, otherwise the bomb blast can't take place. I agree with it. Imagine the Lashkar Tohiba if they're involved, if you interrogate a thousand innocent human beings, they'll get ready-made recruits. Ready-made. You torture them, ready-made recruits. Isn't the police helping the Lashkar Tohiba? I'm sorry, please don't get me wrong. I don't want them to misunderstand me, otherwise they'll come to arrest me also. <laughs> What signals are you sending? Imagine if I agree with you that your theory is correct, that Lashkar Tohiba is involved and they want local hands, you should get the Muslims in confidence. You can't round up a thousand innocent Muslims. We know, we understand that getting the culprits is very difficult, especially because the bomb blast was done with precision, with accuracy. It was a mastermind, according to the police. We know it is difficult. We understand your case, but that doesn't mean in the name of interrogation you pick up a few innocent people. We can understand. But thousands, what message are you sending? Do you think my lecture will be effective? Maybe I will be able to convince 2, 3 percent, 5 percent, not more than that. So we have to solve the problem. What is the root problem? And the police should get the confidence of the citizens. If that is not there, how will they be able to stop terrorism? And if you want respect, you should give respect. There were good policemen also. Many of my friends who are advocates and lawyers, they told me that there were good policemen who helped the people when they were harassed. Some of the policemen had a very good heart. They helped them, they supported them. But generally, oh, you have a beard. Why do you have a beard? Oh, you have trousers above the ankle. Why do you keep it? Wearing a cap, as though it is mentioned in the rule book, a terrorist should have a beard, should have trousers above the ankle and a cap, then I would be number one terrorist. Even I have my trousers above the ankle, I'm wearing a cap and I have a beard. What signals are you sending? There should be a proper training, a proper understanding of the religion of Islam. That's what William, when he advised, he told the US government that you don't know Islam. George Bush doesn't know Islam at all. It was an article that came yesterday in the midday. He doesn't know. Unless you don't understand, how will you be able to solve the problem? I don't want the police to misunderstand me. When I tell the Muslims that killing innocent people is wrong, though many Muslims disagree with me, Quran condemns it. Our Prophet condemned it. Killing any innocent human being, you can't justify it. I have to speak the truth. At the same time, I even have to speak the truth to the police force. I hope they understand the situation. 
And according to Julio Ribeiro, he writes an article in Hindustan Times, I think it was the 9th of September, he says that more the unnecessary arrests that are made to get a breakthrough becomes more difficult proportionately. The more unnecessary people you arrest, the chances you get at the real culprit is more difficult. On the 2nd of September, 2006, there was a good gesture by the police commissioner of Bombay, A. N. Roy. He wrote a personal letter to a couple of hundred Muslim leaders saying that the investigation is unbiased, we aren't harassing the Muslims. I too received one of these letters. And he said that if there is any query, any questions, we can come and sit across the table. We can talk. It's a good gesture. The letter came recently, just maybe a week back. I only hope it is not a theoretical exercise of public relations. If it's practically implemented, that innocent Muslim should not be harassed. If you really want to get the confidence, you see to it that you get the confidence of the Muslims. And then only you will be really able to catch the culprits. And if you get the culprits, whoever they are, surely they have to be punished. We know the authorities, they tell us, that why majority Muslims have been picked up. The argument given was that when we analyze that in Punjab terrorism, majority people arrested, they were Sikh. In Ulfa, in Assam, majority were Hindus. In Tamil Nadu LTT, they were Hindus. So, but naturally in Bombay, because you know we think it's linked with Pakistan Kashmir, it would be Muslims. I agree with you for sake of argument. If a terrorist attack is done in Punjab, the majority of people living in Punjab are Sikh. So if majority Sikhs are arrested, it is logical. In Assam, majority are Hindus, so if Hindus are arrested, it is logical. In Tamil Nadu, majority of people living are Hindus, so Hindus are arrested, logical. In Bombay, are the majority of people living Muslims? The Muslims are in minority. So why are they being picked up in majority? <laughs> if you think it's an act of Kashmir militant, if you have got records, we have got no doubt with that. But do you mean to say the LTT can't come to Bombay? Do you mean to say Ulfa can't come to Bombay? Do you mean to say Sikh terrorists can't come to Bombay? You cannot say 100% this act has been Muslim. You can say high possibilities. And if you show proof, we are with you. What we are trying to tell you, that identify the people who are responsible, catch them and punish them. But not thousands of people, innocent Muslims being rounded up. We know there are several records. Just a couple of months back, according to the ATS of Maharashtra, 16 members were arrested from a hardcore Hindu organization. They were involved in three bomb blasts in mosques. Mahmoudi Mosque in Parbani, one of the mosques in Jalna, one in Pura, three. And recently on 6th of April, in one place, by mistake, a bomb detonates by mistake. While they were making a bomb, it exploded. It killed four people and 11 were injured. When inquiries were made, many people belonged to the same hardcore Hindu organization. And they found there that the plan was that to attack the mosque in the guise of Sikh. You know, this took place in Nandit. Sikh, why? Because there was a rift going on between the Muslims and Sikh. A Sikh girl married a Muslim boy, so there was tension, so they wanted to get advantage. So they wanted to do an act in the guise of Sikh. There are cases we know that Hindus have attacked wearing caps and beards. So you can't say 100% Muslims are involved. Maybe high possibilities, I'm not saying no. Recently, a few days back, on Friday, 8th of September, four bomb blasts took place in Malegaon. One outside one of the mosques, one outside a graveyard, in which 35 innocent Muslims were killed and more than 100 innocent Muslims were injured. Again, prime suspect, LAT. Can be, but not prime. Imagine, it is a game plan. It's a no name game. If you go to America, it's Al Qaeda. Here it is LET. According to an article that came in the DNA on the 6th of September, a person by the name of Joseph, he writes that the foreign experts they tell that if you involve yourself too much in the blame game, you lose focus and the main culprits are never caught. You do a proper investigation. If really they're caught, they have to be punished. 
irrespective whether the terrorists are Muslim or non-Muslims, whether they belong to Kashmir, whether to Pakistan, whether Ulfa, whether LTT, if they are proved to be involved in that, they should be punished. I am not here to support any terrorist act, not at all. But if you want to get to the bottom of it, you should know that this should be done meticulously. We should take the citizens in confidence. One of the other cause is the media. Mainly that media which is controlled by the politicians. We have to be careful of this. And this media, they can convert black to white, day to night, hero into a villain, villain into hero. And we see that very often. If you see my tapes, I've given very such examples. But in India, it's fortunate that the more popular media is not controlled by the politicians. And we find that this media really gave the true picture, whether it be the Gujarat riots, the Bombay riots in 93, or even today, the innocent Muslims are being harassed. The media, whether it be the newspaper, the news channels, they have really given a true picture of what's happening. Not 100%. Sometimes they get involved in news which is sensational. So when they get the news without checking up, they give it. It's sensational, they give it. But as a whole, we have to agree, the media has been honest. I'm talking about non-Muslim media. I'm not talking about the Muslim media. And here we find that they were honest and they projected the real picture. But what we have to be careful is of the media which is controlled by the politicians. And as far as the judiciary system is concerned in India, the innocent citizen of India, especially the Muslim victims. We have faith in the Indian judiciary system. Though some people say that some are corrupt, they are blasphemed in the community, but as a whole, we know most of the judges, they are upright and they are honest. We only hope that these people are not influenced by the politicians. So far, I know most of the judges, they don't care much for the politicians. If once the politicians get hold of the judiciary system, then God save this country. Yet, we have faith in the judiciary system. And to conclude, we have to realize that since we know that the cause of terrorism is injustice, the cause of terrorism is wrongdoing to a particular group of people, this thing should be stopped. How can we stop? As I mentioned, number one, the politicians, they should be honest, they should be just. They should not go for the vote bank and do things which are wrong. Once they're honest and they're just, irrespective, they lose their seat. You see to it that terrorism will stop. Point number two, the innocent, Indian citizens, they should not be instigated by the politicians and do wrong things and kill other innocent human beings. Point number three, the police, they should be upright. They should be just. If someone is being harmed, they should see to it that he's protected. They should not be ploy of the politicians. I know there are times that they can be transferred, but if every policeman in India is honest, the new policeman who stands for will also be honest. So what will the politician do? If 100% of the policemen, I'm not blaming all of them, please don't get me wrong. I know most of them honest, they want to do, but because they're under the pressure of the politicians, they're afraid that they'll be transferred, they'll be harassed. But if all the policemen get together and say, let's all of us be honest, if they transfer you, the new person coming will also be honest. So there itself, most of this trouble of injustice will stop. And last but not the least, people cannot take the law in their hand. They cannot kill other innocent human beings, even if they belong to the same community who has an injustice on you. If we take this and we see to it that injustice is stopped, then surely India will be a very good country. It is estimated that in the next, by 2020, India would be a superpower. If all the Hindus and Muslims, if we live together, if we love each other harmoniously, we may have our differences. The differences will be there. We live with our differences. But we love each other and we live peacefully and harmoniously. Again, India will be a superpower. And Mahatma Gandhi, he said that if India has to improve, it should be ruled by a dictator as honest and as upright as Hazrat Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, the father of a nation, he advised the best thing India can do is have a dictator like Hazrat Umar. May Allah be pleased with him, radiallahu anhu. He was an honest person. When it came for justice, he did not see whether he was a Muslim or non-Muslim. For justice, he gave justice. Therefore, he got the title al Farooq, the person who differentiated truth from falsehood. I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, 
verse number 21 which says waqul jal haq mazak al batil in al batil kan nazauka when truth is heard like in falsehood falsehood perishes for falsehood is by its nature bound to perish i would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of dr adam pearson who said that people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the arabs they fail to realize that the islamic bomb has already been dropped it fell the day prophet muhammad peace be upon him was born wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alamin jazakallah thank you for your appreciation of the talk we wonder how awesome and corrective would be the question and answer session we start the question and answer session quickly may i point the rules your question should be on the topic it should be brief and to the point and only one question at a time may be asked five microphones have been provided in the auditorium one on my left for the gents one on my right for the gents one in the rear for the ladies on the first floor balcony one more microphone number 4 for the gents those who would like to ask questions are kindly requested to line at one of the mics to put forward your question yes the brother here can put forward his question microphone number 2 yes brother we will request you to ask quickly and briefly so we can cover more in the less time we have yes brother assalamu alaikum dr zakir naik my name is mohammad arafat i am a student you said in your talk two wrongs does not make a right a few months we will allow non muslim the first preference please so any non muslim in the queue they are most welcome it's always a policy in our organization that we give first preference to our guest if they non muslim like to ask a question they are most welcome any non muslim with the brothers and sisters they are most welcome the time is limited so any non muslim would like to ask a question they would be given the first chance any non muslim yes brother most welcome mera naam sham hai sham sunar main marathi mahanagar paper mein kaam karta hu patrakar hu आपकी बातों से मतलब आ, मेरे पास शब्द नहीं है क्या बोलना लेकिन ये मुझे लगता है कि भारत में हिंदू और मुस्लिम एक होने के लिए कुछ ना कुछ होना चाहिए ऐसा मुझे लगता है मैं करता आया हूँ दस बारह साल से लेकिन आपके मुंह से मैं ये सुनना चाहता हूँ कि भारत में बस्ती में मैं तो चालीस गांव इस गांव में रहता था मुंबई में रेजुलटी के लिए आया हूँ बस्ती बस्ती में जो हिंदू और मुस्लिम है इनके दिल में अगर गलत फहमी है और वो है भी सही मायने में कुछ हद तक है तो वो दूर करने के लिए आपकी क्या सुझाव है कि हिंदू और मुस्लिम दोनों कम्युनिटी के लोग कैसे इकट्ठे आ सकते हैं ब्रदर आस्ट वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन दैट वॉट इज द सजेशन फ्रॉम मी दैट हाउ कैन वी गेट द हिंदूज एंड मुस्लिम ऑन अ कॉमन प्लेटफॉर्म हाउ कैन वी कम टूगेदर द रिप्लाई टू दिस इज आई है टॉक on similarities between hinduism and islam i've given that talk in bombay i've given the talk in chennai i've given in other parts of india and we find there that tens of thousands have attended in bombay about 20000 in chennai a similar number and other parts of india and many non muslims have attended many hindus have attended thousands of them and many of them told me that brother zakir there was a person just a comment that what i did not know about hinduism in the past 40 years of my life i have learned in the past four hours i follow the guidance of the quran of surah al imran chapter 3 verse 64 which says tala wila qalmitin sawa imran bainakum come to come in terms as me us and you which is the first term allah na abda illa allah that we worship none but one god what we realize that i don't believe in interfaith dialogue we say that hinduism is the same islam is the same christianity is the same this is just a gimmick if i ask the hindu pandit will you become a muslim he'll say no if i ask the muslim will you become a christian he'll say no if i ask the priest will you become a hindu he'll say no so what is same it's not same we have to agree that there are differences but there are similarities also let us agree at least to follow the commonalities what is different keep it aside so what i say that take all the religious scriptures whether it be the bhagavad gita whether it be the veda the upanishad the bible the quran at least what is common what is different keep it aside we can discuss some other time but at least what is common let us agree to follow it and i've given the talk and i've showed so many similarities so many so you can refer to my video cassette and what happens many of them are not aware the muslim not aware of their religion similarly the hindu not aware of their religion many of the muslim objected similarity between islam and hinduism impossible so many of the people came in the talk to attack the rabi am bowling what nonsense hindu and muslim same ho hi nahi sakta but when they heard the talk they were shocked 
those who came to attack, they agreed with the talk. Similarly, many Hindus came. So what we realize that what is common we should follow. And number one is Allah na abud illa that we worship none but one God. That's the most common thing, and which you can give quotations, and we can give quotation from the Vedas, from the Bhagavad Gita. It is mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ekam evidityam, God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Shweta Shita Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Na chasse kasij janita na chadipa. Of him there are no lord. He has got no parents. These are Sanskrit quotations. That means Almighty God has got no parents. He has got no lord. Furthermore, if we analyze, it is mentioned in the Sutta Sutta Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number nineteen. Na tasti pati masti. Of that God, there are no images. There is no pratima. There is no photograph. There is no idol. There is no image. Same thing in the Ayurved, chapter number thirty-two, verse number three. Na tasti pati masti. Of that God, there are no images. So if you go back to your Vedas and your religious scriptures, it speaks about one God. So people many a times are not aware of the scriptures. And when the question just a couple of days back, I had given an interview to Star News. They asked me, Brother Zakir, what is your view regarding Mande Mataram? Can the Muslims say or not? I said, What do the Muslims say? I'll come to it afterwards. I'll first tell you what the Hindu scriptures say. <laughs> He was shocked. What do I mean by that? I said, If anyone who is a scholar of the Veda, the Veda. Agrees that God has got no pratima. So when you say Vande Mataram, that this country is my mother, and you call it God, a person who is a scholar, I am not talking about the normal people who don't know about the scriptures. But you ask a scholar, he will say that Vande Mataram goes against the Vedas, because Vande Mataram in no less than three places it says, I bow down to Thee, I worship Thee. If you see about the Arya Samaj, and you see the various. Top scholars, they think according to the Vedas, idol worship is not permitted. There are verses in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number seven, verse number twenty, which says that you should not do idol worship. So here, when we go back to our scriptures, unfortunately, they believe in a form of pantheism. So even according to the Vedas, if you're a good scholar, this song, Mande Mataram, that I bow down and I worship Thee, as I quoted in Sanskrit about Upanishad, it's against. Even in Islam, there are twelve lines which are objectionable. Three times it is said one day mantram, which means I bow down to thee. If once it says that this country is my mother, once it says I will kiss the feet, once it says about the divine things, about the smile, talking about divinity, it calls it Lakshmi, it is called Durga. All these things are objectionable. We Muslims, we love this country, but we will not bow down to anyone but to Almighty God. Even a mother. Even a mother who has born in a womb for nine months, we love her, we respect her, but we will not bow down to our mother, to our own mother. The number one human being who we love and respect in the world after Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, it is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We will even not bow down to our Prophet, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Is it required that we should sing this song Mande Mataram? It is a political gimmick. Politicians, they thought they get the vote bank. They even made a gimmick on the date. You know when it was written by Bankim Chand Chattopadhyay in 1876. It was published in 1882. Now where is century come now? And where is 7 September? They made a mistake. The politician, political gimmick. <laughs> Furthermore, even a Muslim living in Saudi Arabia, he cannot bow down to his country, Saudi Arabia. Even a Muslim living in Pakistan cannot bow down to Pakistan. It is shirk. So to say that the Indian Muslims are not patriotic, it is our religion. Our Creator, our God, who has made this country, is far superior. So we love this country. When required for the truth, we are willing to die for this country. But we will not bow down to anyone but Almighty God. We would prefer questions from non-Muslims first because we have a limited time. I think it would be fair to the occasion. And people who would like to ask questions on slip can kindly write on the slips and pass it on down the aisle. Yes. Any other question with any sister there? A non-Muslim sister? Yes. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to everyone present here. My name is Preeti Sethi. I would like to ask you, sir, as in your talk you have said that Osama bin Laden, we can't consider him as a terrorist, as it is said in BBC and CNN channels. But at the same time, we get the same information about the bomb blast and the count which we get about the bomb blast on the same channels. So whether it has to be believed or no. Thank you, sir. The sisters asked a very good question, very relevant question. I said that when we talk about Osama bin Laden, 
that if you get information of BBC that is a terrorist, we don't have to believe. But when we get the count of the bomb blast, do we have to believe? That's what I said, the people controlling. That doesn't mean all the news of BBC is wrong. That news in which they make a hero into a villain, in which they'll benefit, you have to check up. So here when we see that these normally bomb blast figures that you get, most of them that you find will be somewhat similar. If it's a government channel of the country in which the bomb blasts are taking place, the figure will be normally no. Why? Because the government wants to show that less people have been killed. Like the police commissioner wrote to me, 187 people killed. Newspaper writes 207. I don't know who's right. I'm not saying that Commissioner A.N. Roy is lying. I'm not saying that. Please don't get me wrong. So here we have to realize when we get information, we have to see the proof. When we see the proof, about Osama bin Laden, even on the channel, it is mentioned prime suspect, sister. Prime suspect. Prime suspect. Do you know, if you go to the website of the US Department of Justice, Info Police, they give the list of the terrorist organizations. Terrorist organizations. 43, 60% are Muslim. Can you guess which is the most popular terrorist organization? Can you guess Muslim terrorist organization? Can you guess? No, sorry. Which is the most popular? Muslim terrorist organization? Al-Qaeda. Al you don't get a prize for that, very easy. <laughs> Al-Qaeda. According to the US Department, you know how many attacks? How many attacks? Ulfa, 749 attacks. Al-Qaeda, only 28. Out of that, 26 alleged, two Al-Qaeda claims they did it. According to the site of US Department of Justice, Al-Qaeda claims, all alleged, not a single proved. Even on the official site of U.S. Department of Justice, not a single attack of Al-Qaeda has been proved. I'm not here to support Al-Qaeda. You know, when Yohan Redley went to Afghanistan, she was arrested by the Taliban. She comes back and she's asked the question, what are views about Al-Qaeda? She replies, I doubt whether Al-Qaeda exists. <laughs> so sister, what I'm trying to tell you, that when we get the information, if you are a man of the media or a person of the media, you can realize and you know that this information mostly will be correct. This has to be checked up. So what we have to realize that it is suspect, prime suspect, prime suspect. Even on CNN and BBC, even though they say it's a prime suspect, they're treating him as though he's a culprit. Can you go and kill thousands of Afghans only because of prime suspect? Not even proved. So, but natural sister, when we hear the news, we have to realize that who controls the news, what is the agenda behind, and then we have to be careful what news you take and what you quote. Hope that answers the question, sister. A non-Muslim brother? Uh, the question has been put forward by my non-Muslim friend. Okay, we'll allow that. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Myself, Saif, and I am a management student. Uh, the question is that, uh, do you think that uh, Muslim uh, feel insecurity, and that's why can we say that the terrorism is its outcome? Thank you, sir. Your comment, please. The brother asked the question that, do Muslims feel insecure? And that is the reason terrorist acts are done. I told in my talk the main root cause of terrorism is injustice. It's not insecurity. Insecurity may be part of it, but the main cause is injustice. Injustice and something wrong done to a group of people. If you read an article that came yesterday on Sunday midday, on the eve of the 9-11, one of the very famous persons, name is William, he writes and he gives advice that the root cause is injustice and wrong done to community. And he agrees with the Bombay authorities that there are possibilities that Kashmiris may have done bomb blasts in Bombay. But he says, what is the cause? According to him, the Kashmiris are unmilitant people. They are peace-loving people. So what has forced them to fight? And he gives his view, it is because of democracy which is forged. He says that, not me. Eh? It's not my comments. Person who is an expert. And he gives advice to people in the world. He says that the democracy is forged. It is manipulated. That's the reason what we find that they're fighting. Same in Palestine. They're fighting because the rights are taken away. So the main cause of terrorism is injustice done to a group or any wrong done. So to get their rights back, this gives rise to a fight, to a retaliation, which is called terrorism by people opposing it. Those who agree with it, they call good. For example, Bhagat Singh. He fought for the freedom of the country. By the British, he was called terrorist. We call him freedom fighter. So depending upon what is the background, therefore, before you give a label of terrorist, therefore, I said terrorism has got different meanings. 
has got different definitions. It changes because of geographical definition. It changes because of history. So the same person who's called the terrorist by British government, we Indians called him a freedom fighter. So like that, we have to find out the main cause is injustice done to a group of people. I'll ask a question from non-Muslim brother on the slip. It's Christopher Lobo asks, how can you prove that 9-11 was an inside job? Brother Lobo has asked that how can I prove 9-11 was an inside job? I've got the proof, I can repeat the proof, it has been proven by other people. Just a few days back, there was an article that came in the newspaper that 75 professors of US, they say, they believe that 9-11 was an inside job. And in the article, it was mentioned, it came in Times of India, I think on the 7th of September, it says that 75 professors and scientists belonging to different universities from different parts of US, they believe that 9-11 was inside job. And they say that there were some politicians in White House who have engineered the destruction of the Twin Towers. And they say the main reason was so that they could attack and they could have control of the oil-rich countries. Open secret, I told you. One of the professors by the name of Steve Joan, he says that we do not believe that 19 hijackers and a few men in the cave in Afghanistan could have done such a professional job alone. They could not have done it. We don't believe. And by God, we are going to come to the truth and we are going to expose. We don't believe in the theory of the government. They don't believe in the theory of the government. And he further goes on to say that we as being professors and scientists, we know that the steel beam of the Twin Towers, they couldn't have melted at the temperature at which the jet fuel was there. And there were systematic bomb explosions which caused this to come down. Otherwise, it cannot come down. There are many tapes. There are many books written against it. I happen to watch many of them. I even happen to watch the video recording of this Professor Steve Jones. And yesterday's paper, we got another news. Three days later, Professor Steve Jones sent on a paid leave. <laughs> Imagine, paid leave. There are many tapes. If you happen to watch one of the tapes by the name of Loose Change 9-11, it was done by a young American of 21 years old. He makes a one-hour documentary. There are many. Many are there. This 9-11 documentary, it has collected clips from the various, of CNN, of Fox Channel, all the news clipping, he took interviews, etc., and made a one-hour documentary. And then he says that people who saw the airplane, they said it cannot be a passenger carrier. It looked like a military plane. It didn't have any windows. And when he shows the shooting, when it comes close to the tower, there's another firing done from the wings, which hits the twin tower before the plane. Then further he goes on to prove, he says that he had statements of the management, the construction company, which had constructed the twin towers. They said, it's impossible. The twin tower made to withstand storm, to withstand tornado. This plane cannot knock it down. And it cannot come down because the fuel burns at 1,000 degrees temperature. This, even for 2,000 degrees temperature, for hours, nothing will happen to it. 10 days later, he changes the statement and said, no, it's possible. Jet fuel can cause damage to the beams. Another professor who gave the statement, he didn't withdraw his statement back, so he was sacked. <laughs> Furthermore, what they did, that in the documentary they show that when the Twin Towers came down, like how you willfully get down any building, and he gave statistics that many buildings in New York, tall skyscrapers, 40 floors, 60 floors, they caught fire for many hours, but none of them came down. It is the first building in the history of USA. It has come down that way. And he showed photographs that when building is deliberately brought down, how do they get down by the explosion? The same way it came down. There was systematic bomb blast, and people who went to rescue, whether it be the firemen, they were interviewed, they said that we were thinking that someone up was pressing the bomb button, and the bombs were going out, boom, boom, boom. So how the twin tower come down? They have given proof. Furthermore, they say that all the proofs given by the government, they analyzed. They said 19 hijackers, some of them, they were trained as flying off the plane, they went to the university and they interviewed the professor. Do you think that this person can do such an act? Impossible. The way the plane took a turn, and I have personally spoken to senior pilots who have flown big Boeings, 
and airbuses for several years. They said it's impossible to take such a turn. And imagine just a new person of few hundred of us takes a turn. What the experts say, it has to be a military plane. Furthermore, information given by the government, you know, phone calls were there. Phone calls. Phone calls said that they said the passengers in the plane, they claimed that they were hijacked. One of the phone calls was by a flight attendant. She says that buildings, water, my God, my God. She's been flying for 12 years. Hasn't seen buildings in New York? Another person, he says, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. Mom, can you hear me? We have been hijacked. Do you believe? The question to be asked, if I'm going to speak to my mom, I will say Zakir. I'll not say I'm Zakir next speaking. He said I'm Mark Bingham. Mom, I'm Mark Bingham. If Mark has to speak to the mom, he will say I'm Mark. He will not say I'm Mark Bingham. <laughs> he gives systematic proofs. Do you speak to your mother telling your surname? So all the proofs, all the phones were taped down, and then he did a survey that can the mobile phone work at 32,000 feet. When a survey was done at 4,000 feet, the chances of mobile working is 0.4%. At 8,000 feet, it is 0.1%. And 32,000 feet, it is 0.006%. 0.006. There's no chance. And the documentary says that today, USA is spending millions of dollars to reach mobile at that height. In 2001, they did it. <laughs> then there are many documentaries. Then the documentary says that there are black boxes. Every plane has got two black boxes. And the black boxes can withstand a temperature of 3,000 degrees centigrade for several hours. And in just 1,000 or 2,000 degrees, all the black boxes have been destroyed. He goes on systematically. And immediately, after a couple of weeks, Osama bin Laden, he gives an interview on the Ummah magazine. And he says, that I am a Muslim, I will not lie. According to me, killing innocent women is prohibited, it is wrong. Killing innocent children is wrong. Killing any innocent human being is wrong, and Islam condemns it. Osama bin Laden giving an interview and saying that. A couple of days back, you get a video clipping from Al Jazeera. Osama bin Laden training 9-11. Because 75 professors say it, and inside job, now they manipulate, and after five years, they're showing on the television. Why? So here we realize everything, it was inside job. And these 75 professors, they have promised, by God, we will come to the bottom of it. Regarding the second attack at Pentagon. At Pentagon, when the airplane crashed, there was no scraping on the grass. Nothing. Only a hole in the Pentagon. And the hole was only equal to the body of the plane. And we see a crater, and they showed on the television. But when the wings went, the wings weren't seen outside, neither were the window panes damaged of the Pentagon. If a plane body goes in and the wing stays out, either the wing will remain outside or the window pane will damage. The building was intact. So how could only in the circumference of a body of a plane, how can the wings go in as well as the tail? I mean, it's fabricated. The people who said that, you know, the plane went just 40 feet above my head. Today, science tells us that if a Boeing is flying at 40 feet above my head, that car will fly away. An interview was taken of ex-military person. He said it sounded like a missile. It had to be a missile. The missile would make that hole. And there was no debris. There was debris only a little bit debris. There was no part of the plane found there. There was only a small engine of a fighter plane found there. Even in the other place, they only find a crater. Time doesn't permit me. The amount of ample of evidence given there. Even a fool will know that this was an inside job. But it doesn't convince George Bush. And what they say. The reason is only to attack Afghanistan, Iraq, and then Iran. They have been predicting that Iran is going to be attacked. They want to have control of the oil-rich countries. So this terrorist attack is for what? One is injustice. Second is for money. It's for power. And when politicians find that he's going to lose the vote, he creates a fear psychosis. Okay, you better elect me, otherwise the Muslims will get you and they elected. Same thing in Gujarat. A fear psychosis was created. If you don't elect us, the Muslims will kill you, and the government came back in power. So what we realized, that this was nothing but an inside job. And there are several tapes, and several VCDs available. 9-11, loose change, then Fahrenheit, many. And if you see all this, it is a blatant, open secret that this attack on the Twin Towers was done by George Bush himself. The, the last question of the day. Sir, my question is very, very, very much basic to you. Uh, I believe that, uh, as you said, terrorism is a fight against injustice, right? I also believe that terrorism is somehow a fight against the government of, by a common people. 
किसी इंसान के साथ अगर अन्याय होता है तभी वो जाके मजहब के नाम पे लोग इकट्ठा करता है और फिर यू नो ही ट्राइज टू फाइट अगेंस्ट वट एवर इज हैपन टू हिम बट वट आई बिलीव इज एक इंसान एक नॉर्मल पर्सन यू नो इफ समबड़ी हम में से अगर कोई गुजरात में होता तो शायद हम भी वही करते जो उन्होंने किया मतलब और आप क्या कर सकते हैं आप पुलिस पे आपको भरोसा नहीं है जुडिशियल सिस्टम दस साल लगा देगी तो एक नॉर्मल इंसान के पास कौन सा ऑप्शन बचता है अगर उसके साथ कुछ बुराई हो तो वट वुड यूर एडवाइस बी टू नॉर्मल मैन लाइक मी इफ समथिंग लाइक दिस हैपन्स टू मी वट शुड वी डू आई एग्री विथ यू what you are saying is that if it happened with you or me when we see our family members being killed in front of us our mothers and our sisters being raped our house is being what do you do and i agree that what you do the same thing a normal human being will do that that's normal unless you have so much faith in almighty god i do agree with you 99% human beings unless he is wearing bangles kalai pe chudiyan pehne to alag baat hai otherwise this is a normal reaction unless a person has faith in almighty god Even I would want to do the same if I did not know my Quran. If I did not know from the Quran, it is wrong. Because if I kill the innocent human being, I am behaving like the same person who caused problem injustice to me. Just because someone does injustice to me, it does not justify me to kill other innocent human being. Just because somebody has robbed me, I can't go and rob a third person. If I catch the person responsible and book him and punish him, that's a different case. But I cannot kill any innocent human being based on the logic of the Quran that it prohibits you from killing any innocent human being. I, because I know the Quran, I will not retaliate in that way. I will try and get evidence. I will try and convince the government if he goes caught free. What I say that all those people responsible for these terrorist acts, whether done in Gujarat, in Bombay, right? Whether the politicians, whether the police, whether the people who have killed, whether the people who did the bomb blast, even if they go caught free in this world. on the day of judgment god will surely punish them so we as muslims believe as it mentioned in the quran in surah al imran chapter 3 verse 185 that kullu nafsin zaiqat al maut every soul shall have a taste of death but the final recompense on the day of judgment because we believe this life is the test for the year after we leave it if we cannot do something here we leave it for almighty god to do the justice and inshallah i'll be punished in the year after if we catch hitler today what punishment can you give him Six million people answer. What punishment can you give him? You can kill him once. What about the remaining five million nine lakh ninety nine thousand nine hundred ten people? Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number fifty-six, that those who reject our signs, we shall put them in the hell fires. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. Today, science tells us that there are pain receptors. So God tells. that on the day of judgment if the skins are roasted we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain if god wants to incinerate hitler 6 million times we can do it we can't do it here so therefore we leave it to the main justice main justice to god